Adam Vincent, a 2018 Hall of Fame uh, member of the Michigan High School Lacrosse Coaches Association. Mm -hmm. We're sitting down with another conversation with Lax History, so we appreciate you sitting down in this beautiful restaurant. Yeah, it's an honor. Thank you. First and foremost, thank you for spending the time. And I start out the easiest question of all. Where did it start? For you, Holland. Yep. Maybe so, explain a little bit. Yeah, so I, um, I, I grew up in Holland, Michigan, and uh, didn't have a chance to play lacrosse in, in high school. But when I went on to campus, uh, actually even before I went to college, I worked at the uh, Hope College Food Service as a job in, in junior high. And I can remember very vividly uh, when I was checking kids in for um, uh, to, to come in for their meals, uh, a guy came in, his name was Craig Kosler, and Craig was a lacrosse player apparently, came in with his equipment, he was all muddy, he was uh, sweaty, he'd just come from practice or some game or something, and I thought, wow, that guy looks really cool coming into the, coming into the thing, and as a you know, young high school guy, I was like, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. I went to, I went to, I ended up going to Hope um, for my undergrad, and I was walking through the center area of Hope College called the Pine Grove, some guys out there playing catch with lacrosse sticks. Never really seen the sport much or had any exposure, but being a freshman and kind of forward and ignorant, I walked up to them and asked them what they were doing, started playing catch with them, and they said, hey, you know, we're, uh, we've got a club here, and, uh, you know, if you want to get, get connected, show up at this meeting at this time, and so I showed up, and they said, hey, you got to buy this equipment. Uh, our practices are here, our games, uh, you know, we practice in the fall, we kind of do some stuff in the winter, and then we play in the spring. And that's how it started for me, and, um, uh, yeah, so it was just uh, kind of a happens, happenstance. Did you play, what did you play in high school? What sports? So one of the things that people don't know much about uh, me uh, personally is I didn't play uh, sports in high school at all. Uh, I was a theater guy. Um, really? Yeah, I was. And um, uh, my buddies all played sports. I was friends with the football players and the basketball players and really enjoyed going to the events and uh, all of those kind of things. Uh, but yeah, never had a chance to really play sports in high school. And uh, once I connected in college to it, um, uh, really, really enjoyed it. Where did the theater book come from? Um, so my father was a, an electrician uh, at, at Hope uh, College. That was kind of my connection to the, to, to the college. And um, met some theater guys uh, through, you know, just through friendships in high school. And uh, they needed some help building their sets for, for these plays. And you had them. And I, I kind of understood how things got put together. I understood, elect, you know, uh, lighting. I understood a lot of other things. And I was kind of, a, kind of interested in it. So I volunteered, I showed up, I was the student technical manager for a number of years in high school, and that's, yeah, that's kind of how I consumed my time in high school. So you were a backstage guy? I was a backstage guy. Making stuff no, no thoughts of going beyond high school with it, college? Um, you know, I didn't, um, only because it was just such a, it wasn't a plan, it wasn't right. like a, hey, I really want to do this. It, it was, was just, it was just, it just happened, and right. I enjoyed it, but I didn't give up a lot of thought to, is there a future here, or is there anything else? Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, and then I saw the guys playing catch and... You had talked a little bit about a loose, sort of a loose-based club team. Maybe mm -hmm. explain that versus something that's a little more... Well, so normal. we were, you know, we, we, we took ourselves fairly seriously. We, uh, but, you know, the coaches were, uh, were um, you know, player coaches. So we had three player coaches or four player coaches, depending on what year it was. And, um, you know, we, we coordinated trips, to, uh, spring break trips, and we had a full schedule, and we had coordinated practices. But yeah, it was kind of student-run, student-led. There was no there was no administration. There wasn't a full-time, you know, uh, coach overseeing things. It was just kind of our our gig. Was it the MCLA, or was it prior to the MCLA? Which it was, is the it I, was it was really prior to all of that. I yeah. W or I M. I'm not even uh, frankly I'm Whatever not even sure yeah. what what all no, that no, was, but yeah. it was kind of us playing all the clubs in the area, right. and that was it. There was uh, a prior to the MCLA. There was a a five-letter acronym, and don't ask me what it was, but I remember it was the IM something, because okay. it had to be intramural or an intercollegiate, yeah, intercollegiate men's club, IMC, whatever it was. Yep. So. Yeah, and a little known fact, so my... Um, what position? Well, so I, I, I did just about everything I could, because I was... I wasn't particularly a great player. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I had fun. I tried to find my niche and never really found it. So I played a little midfield. I played a little defense. I played a little uh, riding the bench and watching people play. Um, but my coach was uh, the current coach at Hope College. Is Mike Shanels is a full time now. They're Division Three. They're varsity sport. Um, 
but Mike was our uh, was our one of our player coaches at the time. Well, and the connection to that, if six degrees of separation, is that Mike started the program in East Grand Rapids, where you ended up being a coach, uh, Mike, winning state championships. Mike was a uh, an integral part of our history. Um, really brought a championship, um, started the kind of the championship attitude at at East because he. His approach to practices and how we conditioned the kids, which was so important, was was really really important. He's a good guy too, and he's a great guy, which is part of that impression. Yeah. So you get through playing club, mm -hmm. and not a you know not an all American career. I'm not saying that, but it, it was not <laughs> safe to say. So somewhere along the line, you stayed in Grand Rapids. Obviously, you, you work here, you, you mm -hmm. raise your family, but somehow the high school, where did high school lacrosse come in? So um, I really yeah. wanted to be coming out of college. I really wanted to be a stockbroker. And that was the job that I that I uh, I pursued vehemently. I went and got internships out on the East Coast. Came back and uh, tried to establish a business uh, here in Grand Rapids. Uh, ultimately failed pretty miserably at, at it. Uh, a couple years of hard work and didn't have much to show for it. But um, through a chance encounter, I had a picture of myself playing lacrosse in my uh, from the college days in my office, and a lady walks by my uh, my cub uh, office. I say office; it was a cubicle. Uh, she she sees that picture and says, "Oh, hey, my son is um, he's a, he's in middle school, and they're going to start a new program at East Grand Rapids uh, for middle school. They have a high school program, they don't have a middle school program. And there's this um, this dad who's never played or seen the sport, but he's going to coordinate the whole thing. And um, yeah, so so uh, yeah, it's just interesting that you played. And I said, so I got the guy's name. I called him up. I said, hey, I've never coached before. I played a little bit in college. Could I help you out?" And, um, and this was East Grand Rapids. And this was East Grand Rapids. So um, uh, back in '95, uh, Rob Elliott and uh, and myself started the uh, the middle school program at East, and uh, started that whole kind of grassroots efforts. And you know, it was kind of back in the day in the mid '90s where not a lot of programs had middle school programs yeah, or, sure. or or really well developed ones. Right. And um, the ones that did had a lot of success at the high school level because they kind of had the feeder program and they had developed the, the skills. So. Um, that was kind of the start of our of our middle school program at East. Obviously, East had an established varsity and JV program at the high schools. Mm -hmm. now, who was coaching at that level? So it was a variety of folks. Like I said, I mean, it changed every couple okay. of years. It was uh, Greg Tannis was uh, was our high school coach, who was a guy that came to East, um, played for a couple of years, then went and played at Hopkins, and then came back to coach for a couple of years. Jim Dart, our hockey coach, said, "Hey, I'll help you out." I'm not sure what his lacrosse background was. Uh, Mike coached for a number of years. Uh, yeah, so it was uh, it was kind of a um, you know uh, uh, every couple of years it changed, and uh, that was a challenge for us. It, although we had some success, certainly sustainable success comes from consistency in, in coaching and consistency in the program. Now, how long with the middle school program before you moved north to the varsity? So three years at middle school, uh, then I moved up to JV coaching, and then I became a uh, uh, assistant at the varsity. And um, kind of every year I kind of moved up. So three years at the middle school, a year at, we started a freshman class because it started to become popular with our middle school program. Now we had a lot of athletes that wanted to play. So we started a freshman program and I was the head coach of the freshman. Then I, a year at JV, and then I became the assistant uh, on the varsity. And then uh, eventually uh, Rick and I um, uh, got together and put together a, a varsity program that, that people would recognize today. So when you became a varsity assistant, Rick de Blasio, another Hall of Fame member from East Grand Rapids, he was the varsity coach. So Rick, um, so our second year in middle school, one of the things that we recognized is we had to solve the problem of a great demand for our sport. A lot of kids wanted to play and we had no coaches. We had nobody in the coaching roster. Nobody played, we didn't have alumni, we just didn't have this cycle created yet. So Rob and I went out and recruited football coach dads because they were all coaching their sons in you know rocket football or what have you, and that's how we got connected with Rick. So uh, Rick was a was a football coach coaching his son at the time in sixth or seventh grade, whatever it was. And uh, hey, Rick, uh, I know you don't know anything about lacrosse, but uh, we need some coaches. You love to coach. Your son wants to play lacrosse. Uh, come out and coach with us. So he became he became one of our middle school coaches, and I kind of as I went along in the ranks um, and moved up, uh, Rick kind of trailed uh, as his son kind of got older in the program. So he he and I kind of grew up together okay. uh, with a year of separation, if you will. Okay. Yeah. So as assistant, when did you become head coach? So I became head coach in, I think 2005 was my was my first year as a, as a head varsity coach. 
but three years prior to that, uh, Rick and I took over the, the varsity program. I say Rick and I because what we did, recognizing the fact that, um, you know, uh, consistency in coaching is really important. So uh, Rick and I went to the board, uh, the lacrosse board at East, and said, hey, we've got a leadership plan to present to you that will take care of take care of the coaching situation for the next 10 years. Rick would be the head coach for the next uh, three to five. I would be his assistant. And then I would uh, take over the program when Rick was ready to step down. And uh, and then I would take over for the next five years. That was kind of the commitment we had, we had made. But uh, Rick and I spent a lot of time together talking about coaching philosophy and you know the things that we thought were important to make a program successful. We were uh, eye to eye on a lot of things. And uh, this kind of uh, consistency and leadership really made a lot of sense to us. It made a lot of sense to the board, and you know we had a little success with it. Now, the fact that East has the kind of program to build athletes, mm -hmm. not just for lacrosse, yeah. that gives you a step up from a lot of programs. Uh, certainly, you know, it, it, people ask me what you know what what are the factors of the success that we enjoyed, and I would point to that as one of the one of the key ones. We had multi-sport athletes, guys that would play sports year-round, um, would come into our program. They were in shape. They knew what it took to win. They were in competitive programs, whether it was football or hockey or um, you know basketball to some degree. Uh, we had guys that knew how to play uh, sports. They knew how to they knew how to behave. They knew how to, what it took to win. They knew what athleticism was about, and they were well trained. And they knew how to play at a high level. And they knew how to play at a high which level, which is a, which is different than just being able to be an athlete. Uh, Absolutely, they were they were experienced in yeah. the playoff atmosphere, yeah. w either winning or losing state championships, regional championships. That was just a kind of a expectation. It wasn't something unique when it happened. It was of course. You know, it was kind of just what we did. When we played you in the 2009 state championship, on my squad I had 29 guys. Uh, I think 21 of those kids had played in a state championship in other sports, mm -hmm. be it hockey, be it football, be it baseball. Right. And, it, I mean, it's just, difference. I can't, you can't replicate that mileage, no matter what you do, you know, right. from that standpoint. What was your philosophy when you started? What, what kind of lacrosse did you play? What did you want to play? Well, from, a, from an attitude standpoint, I think a couple things we recognized. Because we had multi-sport athletes, and because of the size of school we were involved in, we, the few things we paid a lot of attention to was the attitude of our kids and what they had gone through. So these are guys that have played two other sports and not just a season, but in many cases extended seasons. So they were playing sports all the time. They were getting you know, beat up, so to speak, uh, from physically and emotionally throughout the school year. Um, lacrosse is a spring sport, of course, so we've got guys that, are, that have been through it. And so one of the things that was really important to us is we didn't want to treat lacrosse as a one-off or some unique island somewhere. We looked at it as an extension of their athletic career, if you will. And so we never pounded the guys very hard from that, from that standpoint. We thought of it from their perspective. We wanted to make things a little bit more fun in the springtime. Our practices were intense when they needed to be intense, but we, we never took ourselves all that seriously because we knew these guys were, you know, Kind of, kind of getting to the end. You weren't Rice. We, we, you know, we weren't some of the programs that were just, you know, militant about pushing their guys to the, to the, to the end, and um, and we avoided a lot of burnout. And I think, I think, I think genuinely, I, I don't think, I know from the feedback we got from our players, guys recognized that. Yeah, we, there were things that we didn't compromise on, but there were a lot of things that we left up to the players to give us cues on pacing and intensity levels and when did we ratchet it up and when did we take you know, the day off and go get some ice cream or something like this. Having no high school experience and really not going to coaching until you get to this middle school level, yeah. I'm a believer that it takes 10 or 12 years to learn to be a head coach. Just with all the X's and O's and all, that's one thing. Yeah. But to learn all the you know auxiliary things that go along with it, yeah. you had some obviously some mentors along the way that must have been very influential. We did. I think, um, and I think when you're in that kind of situation where, you know, I didn't have an experience of having a good or a bad high school coach. I didn't have, I didn't have that relationship myself to model right. from. And so I think we took a lot of um, lessons from all kinds of different areas, not just sports. How did we manage people? Rick and I also worked together at a company called Wolverine Worldwide. So. Uh, we were both in leadership positions, so we had to manage people, and we had to figure things out from a people perspective in that in that regard. We took best practices from other programs that we saw athletically. Uh, Rick has a rich, rich uh, military background, uh, being ser having served in the Marine Corps, so we took some lessons of leadership development from the from the Marines, and we kind of took the best of those things, made them appropriate for our program, and and embedded them. 
but um, one of the things that it kind of forces you to do is really pay attention to your player and not say, hey, I want to be like that coach and that's who I'm going to be like. Uh, for us, the approach was, what do these guys need? How can we serve them? And without putting like a really fancy title on it or any of the sports psychology on it, it was really about Rick and I having that experience of how do we serve people to get them to do things that we need them to do. And that's really the foundation of what we did. Well, if you think of the background that you both had mm -hmm. and to get to the success you had, pretty extraordinary without having a bigger, a larger background. Yeah. In traditional background, maybe is a better way to put it. Yeah, I, to me it's... Uh, and that's a lesson for other coaches to that, learn that's from. A, that, that's right. I think that, that you don't have to have some rich pedigree. You don't have to be a, uh, an All-American player. You don't have to have played for the greatest coach of all time. I think you treat, treat kids the way that they need to be treated, have high expectations, and... Um, uh, and don't compromise on the things that are important, but don't take yourself too seriously, you're gonna have success. You had, oh, we're good. You had quite a run. Um, talk about your first couple of years and then when you got on the run. Sure. What, was, what, so, what, did, what did you notice, what, what, what changed? You know, um, experience, obviously. Rick and I together, when he was the head coach and I was his assistant, we won three, we won two of three state championships together. And then when I, when I took over as head coach, obviously there's a little bit of like, hey, can I keep the success going? And uh, really important lessons that, that I learned along the way. Um, I will never forget losing to Detroit Country Day. Um, this was in 06, I believe. And um, this was the year where, we still played the state championship like we, we played the semifinal on uh, on Thursday and then played the championship on Friday. Well, Thursday we're playing Cranbrook in the in the semifinals out at Okemos, and there's the, we play about a half and they're a little less than a half and there's this huge lightning storm and we sit in this locker room for several hours until they finally call it and say send everybody home we're gonna play tomorrow so we go and play tomorrow we play more than a half of lacrosse we get all fired up again do the travel thing spend all our energy trying to be cranbrook thankfully we uh we come out ahead we go to play country day on the the next very next day so now we play lacrosse on thursday night friday night and now we're gonna play them on saturday not only uh, so it's significant for that team of course it was also the 100th state title in east grand rapids history it, we were we were primed to win the 100th and um you know you think back and you go hey that that shouldn't matter but it did it was like number 100 right and uh we were up 10 to i think 10 to 4 at one point and um and all kinds of coaching lessons, but uh, we, we ended up losing that game. Our guys didn't have the gas to play the whole time. I was only playing our starters. I didn't substitute smartly, thinking about the fact that we had played the last couple days. And, you know, Coach Kenny uh, is one of the best coaches to come out of Michigan from a tactical standpoint and, and otherwise. And, you know, he, he took it to us and he beat us and, I, and uh, came from behind the win and, and win convincingly. And I'll never forget that. We've never taken our uh, much smarter from a substitution standpoint and training the, 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 all of our roster, not just our star players, clear lesson learned, and how important being conditioned is in our program. And after that, um, we, one of the things that we just prided ourselves on from that point forward is being the most conditioned team in the pop. You attack this like a business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your thought process is more business-like than it is athletic-like. Yeah. That's highly unusual from what, you know, yeah. guys you talk to. Just the background. In fact, I would I would tell you that even even when we were having some success in the in the postseason, you know, I you hear the criticism and you hear the the, the kudos and, and, and you try to ignore it all and just do what you think is right, but but I I, I can remember hearing some criticism about the fact that, hey, Coach Vincent doesn't know much about lacrosse, and so what are we doing all day in practice? We're just running, <laughs> you know? Right. And and then we turn out, you know, multiple state championships because we're the most in shape team. We don't overcomplicate our schemes. We don't try to outcoach other teams. We don't do a lot of time scouting against other people. We just do what we do and we try to do it better than anybody else, and we let the chips fall where they may. But that led to a lot of success and well, simplicity. I used, to, I used to make the joke I was the dumbest coach in the Catholic League. Well, that actually turned out to be not a bad. I mean, there's some pretty good coaches in the <laughs> Catholic right. League, so it wasn't a bad place to be. Yeah, between you and I, we were pretty. We were, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, from from that perspective.
Now, how many did you win in a row? Four? Uh, three in a row. Three in yeah. a row. Yeah. Plus to two. So you were there eight years mm -hmm. as a head coach. How many state championships? So uh, as the head coach, only the only the three. Um, I say only the three, but the three the three state championships. How many ranks? And then, you know, I was I happened to be part of team. Um, let's see, we won two with Rick before I took over the three in a row, and then two more with Rick as as assistant, kind of when I came back. So yeah, so, so seven, seven 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 rings. Yeah. When did you step up? So. Two or three years after we won uh, in in '09, I, I stepped away. My daughter was getting older; career demands were getting higher, and frankly, um, you know, I was I was getting burned out. I could feel that my prep wasn't as uh, as sharp. I was dreading the work that went into being successful. I wasn't um, I wasn't investing my time in the in the players the way that we had in the past. I, I sensed it. I could feel it. I could feel it waning. And that last year we played for a title against, um, uh, ironically, against Detroit Country Day again. It was a new coach this time, but um, after after that uh, that loss in the title, I I had decided earlier in the season to step away. But um, yeah, we lost the state title. I announced to the team that I was gonna I was gonna retire, and that was it. Of the three that you won as a head coach. Yeah. What was the most satisfying? Uh, you know, that's a tough question. They're, they they were all meaningful. So, you know, the most exciting one was the one that you and I shared, of course, because uh, you know, winning in overtime in a t in a state championship game after coming back from from being down and playing a team that was you know you know more talented than we were in my estimation, a, a team that was well coached, that was that was satisfying. It was really exciting. Beating Forest Hills, our crosstown rival, the the year before that, um, you know that that play that has a special role in my heart, has a place in my heart as well. And then, how do you ever forget your first one, you know, uh, as the head coach? So, um, I, yeah, I don't know how to rank them. I would think the first one would. It was special because yeah, you're not I the like guy. The, the, you're the guy. I, the second one in my mind. So. I think in lacrosse, at the top level, the, the unfortunate part about how stratified the, the talent is in our sport, at, at least in the, that area, there were a couple teams that were going to compete for a state title, and that was the that was the reality of how the talent level was at that at that time. So I think it was winning one. It's kind of was your turn. Everything kind of aligned. You had the right talent. You had the right group of seniors. Everything kind of turned out. Winning number two in a row is rare error. And then, and then, of course, three in a row. So that second one was satisfying, not only from who we beat, but the fact that we did it twice in a row with a different kind of group of kids um, was uh, was memorable in that regard. Was there any either personal or program-wide pressure to, when you get into the streak, all of a sudden there's comparisons to Big Brother in Detroit, in this case, Brother Rice. Did that ever creep in at all? Um, or was that, I, I didn't feel... Because you're far enough away. I didn't feel that directly, other than the overall expectation that has been an undercurrent of East Grand Rapids athletics. Um, you know, our, our the first athletic director that I coached under, Jerry Fouch, is a great athletic director. He he said it comically, but but there's a kernel of truth to it, or more than that, where he said, "Hey, you know, Adam, we are to be clear, we are with you when you win." And we are with you when you win, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, I, I get it. <laughs> so, but but and, and it wasn't like it wasn't in a nefarious way, but it was just a like I said, kids experience success at a lot of different levels, um, a lot of different sports at East, and yeah, it, it wasn't a surprise that we were going to be in the playoffs or competing or in a position to to win. It was just an expectation. It wasn't even any real pressure necessarily. It was just what we did and, and that was part of the part of the package. Now after you left, the program kinda dipped a little bit. Yeah. Rick made a, a came back three years ago? Yeah, so so we had a couple guys after I left, um, and, and then we were like a lot of other programs, struggling to find a head coach. I mean who are you gonna find to do this? There you know, thankfully there are some college programs in the area now that the sport had been more popular, there's more people to pick from. But the reality is people who are gonna volunteer for that for that uh, head coaching job are going to be younger guys that maybe have played before maybe or maybe not had some good coaching experience there wasn't a teaching position associated with the job so we were getting you know younger college guys and we had some really quality guys that sat in that seat for a while but they hadn't been there and and they didn't know how to do and they didn't have the the benefits that we did 
And so um, after a couple of years of that, Rick came out of retirement. And um, uh, once, once he had uh, taken the head coaching job and committed, I waited until that commitment was made. And then I called him up and said, hey, I uh, heard you took the head coaching job. And he said, hey, I'm willing to hand it over to you if that's why you're calling. And I just said, hey, no, I'm, I'm good, but I will help you out. So Rick and I got the band back together. and. We lost to Forest Hills that first year and uh, uh, against a very talented uh, Central team, but next year we came back and, and beat them and did it again. So Pretty good duo. Yeah, we have a lot of fun together. Explain your, your ex maybe talk about your athletes the last setting versus five, six years previous. Or is, was it that business approach and that in, in, in yeah, installation you know, of what you guys of the, put together? A lot of the themes that we had that we had put in, they, they matured a little bit, we dialed them in, but they were the, it was the same concepts for us. Um, I tell you the thing that was most apparent to me watching these kids, like the first practice of the year where we came back uh, in the last couple of years, the kids had been so well coached. They were so prepared for the first practice because they had all been doing the travel across thing. They had played all kinds of camps and travel teams and had you know received coaching from guys who were much more qualified to coach the technical aspects of lacrosse than Rick or I um, and so that first practice was just amazing where we would have been teaching guys how to hold the stick to pick up a ground ball right. 10 years ago now right. these guys are running plays that they had just got taught at some you know some some team and and now it was just about putting them into a system where we had some consistency, doing the right things from a from a conditioning standpoint, and really working on the team aspect more than the lacrosse stuff. Because we, you know, Rick and I weren't going to contribute much there from a technical aspect. Now, from a technical aspect, you guys decided to go to zone defense, and I'm just just a personal question from my standpoint. Sure. I remember having a conversation with you <laughs> five years previous because when I went from Waterford to St. Mary's, yeah. I was I, the reason I ran into three three is I understood basketball. <laughs> yeah. I, when I was St. Mary's, you had to play man, and I get that part. I remember you said, swearing we would never play zone. Somewhere <laughs> along the lines, you guys figured out that the zone works. Yeah. Virginia wins a national championship five, six years ago with a zone because they couldn't. They lost two of their best defenders. Yeah. So my question to you is that when did that morph into this yeah, very aggressive 3-3 zone? You know, Coach D was a big zone guy and, and loved it. And, um, you know, it has all kinds of advantages that people don't consider. I think, you know, with – who was it? Tierney at Princeton bringing the, you know, this ubiquitous crease sliding defense. Everybody kind of copied that. It was well known. Everybody kind of got it. The thing I found with running zone is people, first of all, coaches didn't want to run it because for some macho reason they felt that it was like admitting that they weren't good enough or they weren't athletic enough or they had something. I, the thing I experienced with the zone is um, uh, that I loved about it is I loved seeing the frustration in the opposing coaches you know, uh, 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 body language because you don't practice against it. They don't practice against it. They completely, for whatever reason, do something completely the opposite of what they wanted to do in the first place, and th think they have to put in some second offense to to attack it. And so they end up spending wasting time in their practice trying to prepare for us, which I love. Um, you know, um, they don't spend enough time doing it. So whatever they threw at us in the first quarter, we could generally adjust with positioning and just make sure we covered the one carry throwback skip pass play that they had put in that they thought was going to beat the whole thing. And then they were back to going, I don't know what else to do, and their players didn't really know what else to do. And, um, and so from that standpoint, it was just doing something that was effective but was a little different than everybody else did. And we f we've always found strategically that those are good decisions to make. We, you know, we put in a 10 man ride late in the, late in our career, actually after getting beat by Country Day, that was a, that was a good lesson uh, because they, we could never clear the ball and we never had good chances against, against their excellent defense. We had very few chances. So we started riding in a 10 man ride. That wasn't very common in high school at the time. Now a lot more guys are doing it. But again, it was just something that was different that you either had to prepare for or you were surprised about and then you were trying to figure it out in the, in the sidelines. There's nothing like watching a coach try to explain something to their kids in the middle of a game on how they were going to beat some strategy that they weren't Draw up in the for, sand, you know? which never works. Which if you haven't practiced it and you draw up in the sand, you're going to fail. Yeah. <laughs> That's hard, for failure. It's hard just, enough putting in a system that we have three right. months to do it uh, versus right. uh, you know 30 seconds. In the league I'm coaching, we have Tecumseh runs a 3-3 zone, yeah. but I've, I have a 1-4 flat where we just find the spots. 
mm-hmm. and it, it's a pretty effective offense because basically we, I believe in dodging into a zone, mm-hmm. and, and there's no reason you can't. What it's what's funny, and you, you say that, coach, and I think that that's the right the right approach. It, it's amazing how many of the best athletes in the state just would stop dodging against us because we were running a zone, not because they couldn't dodge against us, because that's not what coach said we were going to do that day. We were going to carry, throw back, right. fill, and and replace. And it's like, no, do, you know, in all honesty, if you just dodge against us, we probably won't cover the adjacent because, in all honesty, there's nobody does it, so we're not prepared for it. But we're just kind of rotate against your rotation, and we'll play that game all day long. We, we back pick once we beat the first guy. Now, once you get inside the circle, you got to dish the ball or shoot quick because okay. you're going to get destroyed from that standpoint. But we ran it against the Cumsey, and, and we we ran we worked it through it, and it and it turned out to be a process and I think that's what they're finding that it, it works pretty well yeah. and nowadays you got kids that can shoot a lot better even than 10 years ago. Well what I love about this sport is um, again I don't think it takes a lot of genius to come up with strategies in fact one of the things that I think is effective is looking back at what we used to do 15 20 years ago when we were playing club ball and at, at, at Hope and you know we we talk about oh man the 10-man ride everybody's 10-man riding how are you gonna beat that? Well the way we used remember how we used to clear the ball way back when is you know, you'd, you'd keep all your close defensemen in. You wouldn't sub sub out to get your shorties on and all, all the fancy stuff that they do today. Uh, we just went a four-cross baseline clear, and um, you were riding with your 10-man ride, which means your three attackmen were down. Well, I have four guys against your three. That's, hey, I got an advantage, uh, and now sure. you're chasing me. So it wasn't so much like we came up with these genius things. We just looked back to kind of what, what did we used to do because I think it's – I think at the end of the day, strategy is cyclical. Like, okay, what is a good defense? Okay, everybody starts running that good defense until somebody figures out the offense to beat it. And then everybody puts in their offense because they're all followers. And then somebody figures out the next defense to beat that offense. And it just becomes this cycle. And if you can just get ahead of the cycle by doing something out of the ordinary, I think you have some success. Grand Rapids doesn't have the numbers that Detroit has, but Grand Rapids has had some very per capita or per, per player. You guys have had some belie- unbelievable success with Rockford. East Grand Rapids, mm-hmm. obviously Forest Hill Central. Forest Hill Northern's been a good team. Okay. Uh, Vicksburg, from what we've seen, has yeah. been a good team. Holland's had some good teams. It's a smaller area. What is, what's the secret over here that we're missing? Not necessarily we're missing, but it, it, you're a smaller group with almost the same success as a, as a larger group on the other side of the state. Uh, you know, I think there's a big passion. I think there's a passion for the sport. I think we got. I think we got some great coaches over here now. I think there's a there's a stable of coaches that kind of circle between the between the programs. I think we've got a lot of athletes that love to play. And the more athletes you have, you know, you can make an athlete into a lacrosse player, but you can't make a lacrosse player into an athlete. And Is there any connection or correlation between the fact that if you look at Rockford, East Grand Rapids, Forest Hill Central, those are upper scale? Public schools, mm-hmm. financially, those kind of districts. Yeah, access schools, resources. Yeah. Exactly, opportunity. The schools that are solid in Detroit are schools that have access. Is that part of that discussion? I think I think it has to be. Going back to my comment about how prepared the kids are coming in the first day of practice, being able to play on those travel teams and have the experiences of going to camps and and getting coached by by some top top talent in the off season. And uh, and being able to you know quite frankly afford playing other sports, I, I think all of that plays into the development of the athlete. And and these guys are you know they take advantage of not only sport specific camps, but guys are doing you know advanced uh, uh, athletic training. They're doing speed training. Uh, they're just they're just a finer tuned athlete now. And if you have the access, if if you can access those uh, resources, you can be successful. How many of your kids are two sport athletes, three sport athletes? Just percentage, just curious. Yeah, I'd you know well over safely, I'd say well over half, but but probably closer to two thirds of them have See, that's, are, are playing, that's playing that's another multiple sports. At, at least of the of the guys that are you know in a thirty man roster, you got your fifteen to eighteen guys that are out on the field. I would say almost all of those guys are playing multi multiple sports. It's rare where you just get the lacrosse player that only ever play lacrosse that has that level of success in our, in our program. What's next for East Grand Rapids? Well, I think, you know, um, they're, they're going to have to solve the uh, head coaching challenge that everybody else has to. You know, so they're Rick, without a head coach right now? Well, so Rick, Rick is still the head coach, but, but you know, that's not going to last. So I think one of the things that 
gave us consistency in our success has been not only having uh, a head coach there, but having somebody in the wings ready to take over and is thinking about what are they going to do when they take over in their turn, and that'll be uh, that'll be a big challenge. I think, um, you know, I think uh, continuing to to vitalize the grade school and middle school program so the athletes when they're coming up and they're deciding what is their spring sport going to be, you know, we'd rather have them deciding on lacrosse rather than track or or that other sport that they stand in the field and hang out at. I don't know what that was. Being dad to a daughter will be the best job you ever have. But what's coaching meant to you? What's coaching lacrosse meant to you? You know, it's meant, uh, you know, I, I think I have personally matured in my relationships with everybody in my life because of my coaching. Um, because uh, building those relationships with the kids has been a lesson for me as much as it has been for them. Um, you know the ability to solve problems on the fly and and plan out a season has you know uh, all of those kind of things has meant meant a lot to me. But but I'll just um, probably like every other coach, I would guess the meaningfulness is when you know you get invited to the kids. The kid, you coach the kid, won, maybe won a state championship with him, and he invites you to his wedding. Uh, you know almost out of the blue and hey coach, I was thinking about you. I'm getting married. Love to have you there. I mean, what a, you know, that that's a sign of a relationship and, yeah. and something that went deeper than three and a half months, some spring, sometime. Yeah, that's an important fact. One of the coolest parts of being able to coach in lacrosse is, like you said, we've played against each other in a championship, mm -hmm. and we could have did this side or the other to win or to lose and all the rest of it. But the reality to it is, is it's still it's still a memory that you know you, you got there, you had some fun with it. It wasn't brain surgery, mm -hmm. and I still see those kids. Yeah. And on a regular basis, uh, Ian Brahms, who was my left hander, is now a Navy Ra uh, Army Ranger, went through West yeah. Point. Yep. Some pretty first class kids that we were fortunate enough For to both sure. coach, you know, from that standpoint. What do you think the future is? Where are we headed next five years? Uh, Michigan lacrosse? Mm hmm. You know, I, the thing that I hope and pray for for, for lacrosse in Michigan is, um, you know, continued, continued recognition. And, and growth. It is such a it's such a great sport to, to to coach, to play, to watch from a from a spectator sport. Uh, I hope we continue to adopt it. I hope we continue to get good coaches that are that can afford to stick around for a bit and uh, and lead these young men to to, to some success. So yeah, that, that's what I that's what I'm. I, I, for. I think to some extent we're confused, and I'll, and I'll tell you why I think we're confused. We have a shortage of officials, to say the least. Uh, that we just had a conversation with Bert Smith, an sure. icon from here as an official. We talk about this being a young sport. And we've been playing it for 50 years. Okay. I'm, I'm a little confused because 50 is not a young age. Right. And you, I say that you being two years short at 48. We've been around a while. And the same group of people, um, there's an open job at Heartland. And I talked to the athletic director at Heartland, and his entire goal is that we need a public school to win the Division One championship, yeah, because it never has, and I'm not sure what road we take. We're all competitive to some extent, but there's advantages that some schools have that don't others. And I, I just sometimes think we don't see enough, and I think we get confused with travel. Mm -hmm. And I think travel has changed the. I don't know. I don't want to become soccer, if that makes any sense. Yeah, you know, I, I have, I don't know enough about it to have a, a to to speak uh, candidly about it. But I'll tell you, you know, you do worry about the monetization of the off season. Um, and do people really have the best interest in mind of the kids? Are they really developing the sport? Are they developing the the player? Or are they funding, you know, funding a lifestyle? And and I hope that they're all in it for the for the right reasons. I think that's important. Um, you know. It might be unrealistic, but I've never looked at another team's advantage and said, you know, woe is us. Uh, they just have something that we don't and we never will. It was always just about us. What are we going to do to put ourselves in a position where we deserve to win? We may or may not, but what are we going to do to say we deserve to win? And we're going to focus on those things. And whether or not some team is doing something that we can't do or d won't do is, you know, for me, beside the point, I think you got to focus on yourself. But that's also said for East Grand Rapids, which has, you know, opportunities that a lot of other schools don't have. But you've got to make the most of whatever situation Absolutely. you're in, Absolutely. and and uh, and and try to try to try to leverage those advantages and try to, you know, downplay the disadvantage. That, uh, but that's that's true in anything you ever do. There's always going to be somebody better funded in in a business or 
there's always going to be a better salesperson, but you got to figure out what makes you get successful. There are always going to be great highlights in a career. Mm -hmm. You're laying in bed at night, and one thing comes to mind. There's that one. Is it? Is it just the relationship with kids? Is it a particular game? Is it? Is there an anecdote that you can leave us with? So I will tell you the moment where I think kind of the idea of coaching came came crystal clear to me, and it was it happened to be in our in our, in our in our game that we that we coached against each other in that in that championship game. And I don't know if you remember, coach, but but in overtime, um, you had the ball. Hit the crossbar. I am standing close to the substitution box, and uh, you you have possession of the ball, and you're in your half of the field, and I look up to see my three attackmen, and I got one young attackman. His name is Mackie Avis. Um, Mackie is standing on the 45-yard line on your side of the field. Well, you have possession of the ball. And I look at Rick. Rick sees it. I look at the box official, and he hasn't seen it yet. And I'm thinking, we can't call a timeout. There's nothing we can do. And I'm just waiting for the official to see Mackie standing on. And he's just enthralled because you make this goal and you should make the goal because you had the talent you did. We're going to lose. And, uh, but Mackie just made, makes a mistake. And the thing that I am thinking about, and this is the moment, more than anything else, what I feel bad about is that Mackie is going to be devastated if his mistake, and he gets called for the offsides, we go flag, you know, we, we go down a man. If that mistake leads us to losing a state championship, the thing that I feel the worst about is how Mackey's going to feel about that moment, how that's going to live with him. Not about us winning or losing a championship, not really about what other people are going to think. It's all about what that kid is going to go through. And I am so thankful that we killed the penalty, we come down to the other end, and things turn out for us. Um, but for me, coaching is about that relationship with that kid and being empathetic to what that person is going through and how are you best going to serve them. And to me, that crystallized the moment because I could feel myself thinking about how he felt, not about what we were going to do on man down, not how we were going to get the ball out of that end, about what that was going to do for that kid. And that's the moment of coaching that I think of frequently. That's extraordinary. And I, I say it's extraordinary because it is, number one. But number two is... What's really been cool about this interview is that you've, it's such a different approach than some of the other interviews we've done. Mm -hmm. Really, a, a new way of learning. I've learned some things from this conversation that I'm going to implement some of the things I'm doing mm -hmm. just because it's a different road if that makes any sense. Yeah. So, we certainly appreciate your time. Um, you had an extraordinary career at East Grand Rapids, and uh, uh, for the folks that are going to watch this, we appreciate your time. Well, it's, it's been an honor. Thanks for spending the time with me, and uh, uh, thanks for everything you're doing. Absolutely. Thanks.